Hello all, in this lesson we'll be studying the standard model of particle physics and this is sort of the groundwork or the foundation of the way physicists think about the smallest particles of atoms. Okay, so here's the book work associated with this lesson. It's on uh, questions 47 to 59 on page 197 and our aim is how is matter classified and that's really what the standard model of particle physics will try to accomplish. This flowchart is what is going to centralize your thinking for these three questions. Uh, so what is the diagram to the right depicting? How does the diagram differ from how we typically discuss matter? And in what ways does the diagram agree with how we typically discuss matter? So try to figure out what the diagram is trying to say, and we will answer these three questions together in class tomorrow. Okay. So firstly, let's discuss the fundamental forces in nature. There are several fundamental forces. Um, we have the strong force or the strong nuclear force. Its relative strength is one, meaning that it is the strongest force, so it's, it's one out of one. So it's like the strongest force. But it only is effective over this very short distance. The electromagnetic force is about one one hundredth or 10 to the negative two of the strength of the strong nuclear force and uh, it has a, an inverse squared relationship to distance. The weak nuclear force is significantly weaker than the strong nuclear force, and it is uh, valid only over a pretty short distance. And the gravitational force is the weakest force we know of. It's um, very, very, very small, and it's also proportional to one over r squared, so it's also an uh, inverse square relationship. So on this slide, I just want to know how many times stronger than the gravitational force is the electromagnetic force. So we're just really comparing gravitational to electromagnetic. So if the electromagnetic force is considered a 10 to the negative 2 in this scale, and if the gravitational force is considered a 10 to the negative 38, then setting up a proportion like this will show us how much stronger this one is than that one. So when you combine these exponents in, in this way, where you have a division, you are going to be subtracting the exponents. So it's going to be negative 2 minus negative 38. This, of course, is the same thing as saying negative 2 plus 38, which would be 36. So my final answer would be that the electromagnetic force is 10 to the 36 times stronger than the gravitational force. So you may have seen this awesome diagram in your reference table before. Uh, it's the classification of matter. So we can think of all matter as being divided into two categories. That would be the hadrons and the leptons. So hadrons are highlighted here. They're these nuclear particles, such as protons and neutrons, that interact via the strong nuclear force. Um, so basically, when you think hadrons, think protons, think neutrons, there are some other particles. Um, but they all would experience the strong nuclear force. So that leaves us with the leptons. So leptons are the other general classification for matter, and um, if hadrons all experience the strong nuclear force, then leptons don't. So I can highlight that here. So leptons are particles that don't interact via the strong nuclear force, and examples of them are electrons, positrons, and neutrinos. And in case you didn't take chemistry last year, a positron is basically like an electron, but it has a different sign, and its sign is positive rather than negative, but it has all the same other stuff. So that's why it's positrons and electrons. And a neutrino is neutral, which you can probably tell by the name. Um, it almost has no mass at all, so it's sort of like a neutral electron. So these leptons are all sort of electron-like in, in that they have very little mass but the, only the electrons have a negative charge, whereas positrons are positive and neutrinos are neutral. So I will discuss baryons and mesons and their components, which were, are quarks and antiquarks, uh, but that will be coming up. All right, so let's do baryons versus mesons on this slide. 
So firstly, all baryons and all mesons are hadrons. So all baryons and all mesons experience the strong nuclear force. Baryons are basically just considered the heaviest particles. They're all going to be at least as massive as a proton. Whereas the mesons are going to be of intermediate mass. The smallest masses, of course, are leptons. So we have our heavy hadrons, our, I guess we'll say, medium hadrons. And our leptons would be considered light. Now, there are a couple of other distinguishing factors, like baryons technically are just any particle that could be transformed into a proton or a neutron, um, with some other stuff coming out, whereas mesons are actually um, particles that, when, when they decay, would decay into electrons, positrons, neutrinos. So basically, a baryon is heavy, when it decays, it would either produce a proton and a neutron and some mesons. But when mesons decay, they tend to produce leptons. So you sort of have this sliding scale of like the heavier ones can fall apart and make these intermediate ones, and then the intermediate ones can fall apart and make the light ones. So, first of all, how are baryons similar to mesons? Well, to start out, we could both say, we could say that they're both hadrons, um, which is obvious based on the graph. But in addition, you could say that they experience the strong nuclear force. But the next question is a little bit harder. It asks, how are baryons different than mesons? So how does this differ from this? Um, there are a couple things we can say. First of all, baryons would be heavier and mesons would be a bit lighter. And I would also add that when baryons decay, they can produce mesons, but when mesons decay, they produce leptons. Now the quark and antiquark stuff will be coming up. All right, so let's classify subatomic particles um, and make sure we can distinguish particles versus antiparticles. So an antiparticle is uh, basically the opposite of a particle, but a lot of things will stay the same. The only thing that would really change in an antiparticle would be the charge, um, and possibly the magnetic moment would be reversed in sign. But we don't study the magnetic moment, so for us it's just going to be charge. Um, an antiparticle will also uh, have a bar over the symbol uh, to represent that it's an antiparticle. So for instance, if E represents electron, then E bar represents an anti-electron. And going a little bit further, I had mentioned a positron on the previous slide. A positron is just like an electron with a positive charge, so an anti-electron is a positron. It's just been given a more English name. So if we think about a proton as being um, like a stable baryon with a charge of positive one and a mass of one AMU, then we could describe an antiproton with a lot of that same stuff, but with an opposite charge. So an antiproton will be just like a proton in terms of stability, so it'll be stable. And the type of particle will remain the same. They'll both be baryons, which are types of hadrons. Now the charge on a proton is positive one, so the charge on an antiproton would be negative one. And the charge on a mass is one universal mass unit. And the charge on an antiproton would still be one universal mass unit. So lastly, what do we think antimatter is? So antimatter would be matter made completely of antiparticles. All right, so on this slide, we're going to ignore the lepton, and that's because the leptons basically have no mass and are not made of quarks and antiquarks. Uh, but quarks and antiquarks are the focus here. Now, quarks and antiquarks make up both baryons and mesons, and the thing you should know about quarks and antiquarks is that they can have really only four possible charges. They could have a charge of one-third positive or one-third negative, or they could have charges of two-thirds positive and two-thirds negative. Um, there's no really rule for which kind of quark has which charge, but here are some different names for quarks. We have up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. 
And one of the things that you'll probably notice is that the ups, the charms, and the tops all have sort of like positive adjective names, whereas down, strange, and bottom are all sort of like negative adjective names. And that's how you can line up their charges. But this is on your reference table, so you don't need to memorize it per se. But it's something to notice that up is positive, charm is positive, top is positive. Whereas bottom is negative, strange is negative, and down is negative. Now this is just a small selection, by the way. But um, we're going to take these little individual quarks of like ups and charms and stranges, and we'll combine them in a way that they will equal the charge on a baryon or a meson. So that'll be more on the next slide, but on this slide I have two pretty simple questions for you. What is an antiquark and what is an antibaryon? So in the previous part of the lecture we learned that particles all have antiparticles of opposite sign. So a quark can have an antiquark of an opposite sign, which is how we're going to get from positive two-thirds to a negative two-thirds. And it's how we could get from a negative one-third to a positive one-third. So that's the antiquark. It's a quark of opposite sign. And an antibaryon would be a baryon of opposite sign. Uh, there is one other thing I can add to this, though. So aside from just being a baryon of opposite sign, notice that a baryon would be made of three quarks. And we know what an antiquark is now. It's a quark of opposite sign. But if a baryon is made of three quarks, then an antibaryon would be made of three antiquarks. All right, now, there is a certain quark content that baryons and mesons both have, and uh, we need to remember that baryons and mesons are both constructed of either quarks or antiquarks, but a baryon is made of three quarks, whereas a meson is made of a quark and an antiquark. Okay, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, let's think about a proton. Um, we know that a proton is a baryon, and we also know that the proton's charge is positive one. So yeah, charge of positive one, and it's a baryon, as stated earlier, and baryons all contain three quarks. So we have to arrive at a charge of positive one while also being composed of three quarks. And so, we have six quarks to choose from here. We have ups, charms, and tops, all of which are positive two-thirds. And we have downs, stranges, and bottoms, all of which are negative one-third. And we just need to choose three that, when added together, add up to a positive one. So, for instance, I'll start you off with the wrong answer. Like, let's say that the three quarks that made up a proton were an up, an up and an up. First of all, we would symbolize that content by a U, U, U. U means up. You can see the symbol here below the word. Um, and each of the ups would have a positive two-thirds charge. And when we add all of that together, we're going to get a charge of positive six-thirds, which of course simplifies to a charge of positive two. Now, at the beginning, we already said that protons have a charge of positive one, so that's how I know that all the stuff I just wrote is not true. So instead, we need to choose a combination of quarks that will add up to a positive one. So in my next choice, since the positive two was just too large, uh, my next choice is going to be two ups and one down. Ups all have charges of positive two-thirds, and downs always are negative one-third. And when you add all of that together, you will get three-thirds, which simplifies to a positive one, which is the charge on a proton. So the quark content of a proton is up, up, down. In my next challenge question to you, I want to know what combination of quarks could produce a neutron, which is also a baryon. So that means it has to contain three quarks, and also remember that neutrons have a charge of zero. So which three quarks can sum to give you a charge of zero? I would suggest, that's my first instinct, which I think is correct, 
and up, down, down. Because I know that ups are positive 2 thirds, downs are negative 1 third. And when you add all that together, you'll get 0 thirds, which would simplify to a charge of 0. And that's my final answer. The quark content of a neutron is up, down, down. All right, and I wanted to give you an example of a meson as well. Remember, mesons are made of a quark and an antiquark. And the quark and the antiquark specifically that make up a pion are an up and an anti-down. So I don't know if you caught that, but the bar over the down means anti-down. So up and anti-down. Now, ups will have a charge of positive two-thirds. And a down would have a charge of negative one-third, but an anti-down would have a charge of positive one-third, because the antiparticle is always the opposite electrical sign and the opposite magnetic moment. So positive two-thirds and positive one-third will sum to a three-thirds, which would simplify to a positive one. So the charge on a pion is positive one, which is, of course, the same as the charge on a proton, but it would have only a fraction of the mass of a proton. So here's a note, um, which is worth highlighting and you writing down. When quarks combine to form baryons and when quarks and antiquarks combine to form mesons, their charges will always add, that is, always, they'll always add algebraically to um, one of three possible charges. They can only be zero, positive one, or negative one. There are no other options. So if you ever get a charge that's not one of these numbers, you've done something wrong, and you'll need to go back and change your work. And with that, we've reached our pair up. Uh, I will copy these for you, no need to copy them down. But these summary questions, please copy them down yourself, and we'll answer them in class next time I see you. I hope you learned something, and thanks for watching.